My name is William Brewster. I was born in the year 1564. In my 80th year, members of the settlement who may just have the faintest of any memory of what preceded. I also wanted to impart to them and to future generations the genesis, the origin of our group, our people, and how we came to be here, what we went through, and how it really all started. As I stated, I was born in 1564 in Scrooby, England. My father was the bailiff of Scrooby. He had worked for the local ward. My parents, my family, were believers. During that period of time, what was known as the Reformation had been coming through England. They themselves being pious believers, given the appellation of Puritan uh, during those times, had a very deep belief. I grew up with that belief, and at an early age I had dedicated my life to our Heavenly Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior. As a younger man, I studied at Cambridge, soon to work for William Davidson, who was one of our leading ambassadors. I became acquainted what well, was with the Low Countries at that point in time, Mr. Davidson post-taking in the different areas for our late and gracious Queen Elizabeth. I see as I go through my papers now trying to recollect my memories as to how things really unfolded then, but it gave me a good foundation as to how the world would work. Becoming acquainted with people at that point in France, Spain, who had both frequented the Low Countries, the French because of their bordering there, and then the Spanish because they had actual title to the land at that time, which we would find out about firsthand many years later ourselves. I became acquainted and started going to services with a man named Richard Clifton. Mr. Clifton, Dr. Clifton was a man of great faith and piety and a leader in the Christian community. Uh, he had been known as what they were calling separatists. Uh, many of us had decided at some point in time that all theologically we agreed with our Puritan brothers and sisters. There was just a time when we had to strike on our own. It was just too much of an undertaking to try to reform a church that was so heavenly laden with prelates and bishops the way they were. So Mr. Clifton started preaching nearby and started gathering a small church, of course very much frowned upon. At that point, my father having died, I became the new bailiff in Scrooby. My duties included such things as helping people travel through providing them a time of rest, helping to serve the local wards, and also postal duties, making sure that various messages and various messages and, and mail was being carried back and forth. So very soon after, Mr. Clifton removed from Babsworth to my house in Scrooby. Also interesting during this time frame, a young man started attending Mr. Clifton's services in Babsworth. His uh, family came from much further south and did not approve of his attending. His parents both passed. He was in the care of his uncle, who had threatened to withhold his inheritance. At that point, the young man kept coming back and forth to the church. He must not have been more than 13. I had invited him into our house to live with us in Scrooby. His name is William Bradford. At that point in time, as the church started to grow, uh, and the services were held. We became acquainted, I became acquainted, with another younger minister at the time by the name of John Robinson, who had also been deprived of his vestry. Soon thereafter, we had encouraged, I really encouraged Pastor Robinson to join us and, and Mr. Clifton, which he had done. They had been acquainted with each other, obviously. And soon thereafter, we had put together quite a group of people, not a large group, but a very faithful group of people. I myself have been chosen to serve as the elder of the church, lay leader, so to speak, as you would have it. However, within a few years after that, certainly after the death of Queen Elizabeth and the ascension of the Stuart King James, 
of Scotland and England, uh, the bishops started to pray on his heart. By 1607, 1608, it was becoming untenable. We were being thrown into the jails. I myself with many of our brethren going into Lincolnshire nearby Boston were in prison there in their jail for a while. Finally removing, we decided, as many other separatist churches had done, to remove to Holland. Holland wasn't any freer than England. We'd find that out very quickly. However, we would be allowed to exist down there without being actively persecuted. And that's what we had chosen to do. Our church initially had settled in Amsterdam, along with other churches uh, that were founded by other members down there, Reverend Johnson, Reverend Ainsworth. However, they became into schism with each other, and we decided to remove into Leiden. At that point, we had people from other churches joining us. At that time, we had made the acquaintance of another who would join later on in our endeavors, uh, a soldier. He had been a captain in uh, Lord de Vere, general of the English forces in Holland at that time, supporting them in their fight, in the middle of their fight for independence from Spain, uh, which we had now come during the middle of a truce. His name was Miles Standish, and he and his wife Rose had become acquainted with our church and even worshipped with us. However, within a few short years after that, many disturbing events had happened. One instance that proved that Holland was probably not much freer, or even as free as England, King James mightily objected to the pamphlets we were pressing. I myself being a printer and owning and operating the presses that were printing these, soon fell into the clutches of the king. Going to his kinsman, the staff holder, or the so-called stakeholder in the Republic of Holland, who was a nobleman and a kinsman of, of the king, ordered him, asked him if he could help suppress our presses, which he did with alacrity, destroying our presses for the moment. Other things, our church could not proselytize. We could not have our congregations grow in that manner. People had to join us. We could not actively engage. That became very cumbersome to us, not just among the English there, but we did have some Walloon families, the French speakers in Flanders, and also the Flemish who also joined us in small numbers. By 1619, 1620, Pastor Clifton had somehow retired into the background, and our ministry had been taken over by Pastor Robinson, John Robinson. He was so influential that he would actually take part in the debates in Dort, in Amsterdam, in Leiden, with the Dutch theologians and the other continental theologians at the time. Very bright, energetic man. However, the truce with Spain was coming to an end. One of the greatest fears we had was that falling into the clutches of Philip of Spain was going to be even more deadly than falling into the clutches of James of England. So we decided to remove. However, the reason being also was that the English nation was now to set upon, belatedly after their brothers on the continent, explorations in the New World, in the Americas, particularly North America. It had been explored before, been colonized in Virginia, in Jamestown, uh, the borders of which actually ran right up to the present New Amsterdam. Uh, we had engaged in talks with merchants about removing, and we sedated that, yes, we wanted to do that. However, it was going to be very conditional. We did not have entirely the means. We had some. We never had the connections. We had some. What we had to do was agree to the terms that these adventurers, merchants had. Very successful men, very honorable men, as it seemed to us. And, however, being separatists, they thought it would be too much of a burden with us alone. So they insisted on having other people come along. And they did. Some of them were very talented men. One or two had even been in North America before. Um, very much pillars in their community. However, there were differences between they and us. We being separatists, they being very much of the Church of England, or at least thinking they were. And then there was the crew. We were going to embark 
back to England, which we did, many of us, and we were going to take ship from there. The plan would be to set up a colony in the northern parts of Virginia and then hopefully bring back our other brethren in Leiden after to help with the settlement. Well, we get into England. We had a couple of delays. First delay we had was which embarkation point. We started in London, where one of our ships, the Mayflower, had been docked and was moored, and her owner and captain, master, Christopher Jones, resided, and Rata Height right outside the city. And there was another ship we were going to engage on the Speedwell. So we were going to have 120 of our members go over. Well, no sooner had we taken off out of Portsmouth that the Speedwell somehow broke a leak. We had to return. This time, not everybody could leave, but we wanted to bring as many as possible. So what we decided to do was bring 20, half of them, over with us. The other 20 would have to wait for another voyage. On the voyage over, it was very providential. We were blown off course. We had many bad storms at sea. Fortunately, the crew was very expert. They had been on those seas before, but even for them it seemed challenging. Finally, after more delays, it was sometime around November that we made our way to these shores in New England, off of Cape Cod. Um, and then we discovered we were far off our course. Knowing where we were, obviously we were not lost, but we were far off our course. And now we never had a patent. The patent we had was not valid. At that time, our Pastor Robinson had told us that we needed to help start a commonwealth where we had godly principles. So those of us among our saints had drawn up a, an agreement. We call it a compact. Many of the strangers agreed to it. There was one incorrigible one that did not want to, but eventually he relented. Um, but many of them were at first wary about it. Eventually they did agree, and we agreed that we were going to settle where we were. Going to Virginia was too untenable too far off course, and we were running out of supplies. Then it became a task to sound the harbors, explore the coasts, which we did. We had been going to a shallop, uh, ably with the crew, and many of our leading men. There would have been William Bradford, Edward Winslow, another man that made my acquaintance in our church in Leiden, and one of our leaders. Miles Standish, Mr. Coppin, another member of the crew, and he had suggested they sound out a harbor further in south of the Cape, or north of the Cape, actually. And what they did was they had mentioned they had been there before. They thought there may have been an abandoned village of some type, excellent place for harbor. So it was decided they did that. The 10th, being so close to the Sabbath, actually it was, this, I mean, the uh, night being so close to the Sabbath on a Saturday, they decided that Sunday to stay. Oh. On that Monday, on the 11th, they decided to take the shallop in, and then they landed in a place that Coppin had told us had been named New Plymouth. One of what we needed to do is we wanted to bring over our other brethren from Leiden. There were roughly 200 members left in Leiden. We brought back almost every single living member left there to settle with us here. Sadly, our pastor, John Robinson, was not one of them. His sons did come back to Dover eventually, one in particular, but he passed in 1625. There's a whole lot more to tell about this story than I've already imparted to you, but that was the beginnings and the genesis of what we've done. And I wanted to before my day's end, give you the vantage point of somebody who was at the beginning of our church, right through the full energy of our settlement and our colony here in Plymouth. And we hope you are able to continue our colony on.